special day for Nichols, in some ways, really special for me. We have two guests today, Bridget Hughes and Yi Young Lee. Bridget's a Nichols alum, class of 1990. Her significant talents were on display in the classroom and on the soccer and lacrosse fields here. So you might guess why this is a special day for me. It's the soccer part. After receiving a Master's in Fine Arts from Northwestern, she went to work for the Paris Review, considered at the time to be, by most, to be the world's most prestigious literary magazine. We've since learned Founder used it as a cover for his CIA activities. <coughs> oh, how I missed the Cold War. Sort of Vladimir Putin, I guess. <laughs> As far as I know, Bridget's work there focused on editing some of the world's best fiction, not on spying on our adversaries or promoting American culture in Eastern Europe, but I could be wrong. Because wherever I go, when people find out that I know Bridget Hughes, they're really impressed and a little bit intimidated, and certainly not by me. After taking over as editor of the world's best known little magazine, Bridget left to start her own, a public space, a Brooklyn-based quarterly that describes itself as an independent magazine of literature and culture where there are no boundaries or stipulations with the exception of requiring authenticity, curiosity, and an honest voice. Magazines are collaborations, Bridget once said in an interview. The best magazines, the best ideas come from a dialogue with your fellow editors, writers, readers from wonderful, lively conversation. There must be an openness, invitation, <coughs> and expectation to question, to disagree, to be curious, to be wide-ranging in your interests. And I hope that's something that we can foster here at Nichols in our own classes. As her guest, and as our guest today, is fiction writer E. Young Lee. This Lee was first published by Bridget when Bridget was at the Paris Review. Ian Lee grew up in Beijing and came to the United States in 1996. Her debut collection, A Thousand Years of Good Prayers, won the Frank O'Connor International Short Story Award, the Penn Hemingway Award, the Guardian First Book Award. Her first novel, The Vagrant, was shortlisted for the Dublin Impact Award, and her second collection, Gold Boy, Errol Girl, for the Frank O'Connor International Short Story Award. She was selected by Grant as one of the 21 best young American novelists under 35, and was named by the New Yorker as one of the top 20 writers under 40. Interesting, right? She was awarded as a MacArthur Genius Fellowship. She was awarded a MacArthur Genius Fellowship in 2010, and she's a contributing editor to Public Space and lives in Oakland, California with her husband and their two sons, and teaches at the University of California, Davis. So first, I'd like Bridget to say a few words um, to her dismay, but come up and have at it. Well, it is feeling very special for me to be back here um, after so many years and to see so many familiar faces um, and teachers who really formed um, the editor I became. I remember very fondly an American literature class with Mr. Desitel, an African literature class with Mr. Stratton, um, working on the magazines here, The Gleaner, and the other magazine, whose name I went to forget, The Leviathan. Um, and uh, I am going to speak very briefly. Um, one of the things I like about being an editor is um, you are sort of off stage behind the scenes, so being up here in front of all of you is a little um, unfamiliar to me, but I did want to introduce Ian Lee, who's a writer um, who's been sort of central to the editorial work I've done. Um, years ago, when I was working at the Paris Review, which was a tiny little magazine um, on the Upper East Side of New York City, we sort of worked in the basement of the editor's home, and we had something called the slush pile, which is where any new writer sent their work in, um, and you know we would sit there for hours and hours reading reading manuscripts. And I remember um, vividly one morning, <clears throat> one of the readers walking up sort of the spiral staircase with a manuscript in his hand and saying, I think you want to read this story right now. Um, it was Ian Lee's first story, um, and the first sentence I still remember. Um, his story, like the story of every one of us, started long before he was born. Um, I think that sentence has really defined everything she's written, two novels, two story collections. 
Um, we published that story, Immortality, in the Paris Review, and I have read and argued and edited almost everything she's written since then, um, including an essay in the most recent issue of A Public Space. Um, so it is a real pleasure and um, honor for me to have you all here this morning um, and to have her um, talk to you for a few minutes. So thank you and thank you. if you have already lied today. <laughs> but it's so early, you might say no. <laughs> Has anybody told a lie today? There! Someone <laughs> wants to share a lie? <laughs> Do you want to share? Go ahead. <laughs> Because you know, remember, not nowadays we have 
have those, you know, people that when people knock on your door, you can look. But in the old space, it's not people. The people, it's it's a device that it's a little, you know, amplifying device they build into the door. So if you talk outside a door, the host and hostess can put their ear on the floor and listen to you. So when you leave the party, you say, well, that's really a boring party. Don't say that, because they're eavesdropping on you. So, I, I, eavesdropping is such a good activity that <laughs> it used to be illegal in Victorian England. If you eavesdrop, if you were proven you were an eavesdropper, you could be put into prison for that activity. The reason is, it's stealing. You know, in other, in many languages, eavesdropping in English has this beautiful concept of standing there not getting wet. But in Chinese and in Norwegian and in Swedish, you know, you know these are different languages, but they all have this concept of steal. In Chinese, it's steal, listen. So when you steal, when you eavesdrop, you are stealing something from another person. So I like that because that's a writer's job. You steal something from another person. So a few, a few weeks ago I was in London and I was in a, a, a this hotel lobby. It's always interesting to sit in the hotel lobby and, and see what's going on. So I, 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 saw, I saw this beautiful woman, fabulous. And they were talking in a language I did not understand. And then the third man came and he's, he's a Frenchman. He's a French businessman, but they have to converse in English. So it turned out that the two women were from Greek, and the man was French, but working in London, and I mean, they had some sort of shady business going on. <laughs> I mean, can you clear it? See, it's very shady, and the woman said to the man, do you have a good lawyer? And he said, I do. And I know the man said, you know, let's listen to this person, you know, he's my man, he's and I'm not going to go there, and blah, blah, blah. And at some point, I, this, this, one of the women said, to the man, I want you to make it beautiful, as beautiful as a Russian prostitute. <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> that is just a fabulous line. <laughs> I, 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 I can make a little story about it. And, and I, of course, you know, I, just, I was just like a little rat in the cheese flat. <laughs> solid gold. There's no culture coming with gold. <laughs> and I just thought, you know, that's a story there. That's three people. I, I just eavesdropped on three people's stories. <laughs> and I think that's interesting because they, I mean, I'm sure I was there sitting there. Somehow they could not detect my presence, which was great. <laughs> there was another man there that eavesdropping and I, at the end of the hour, I think he was too embarrassed, he left. <laughs> and so so that's, that's a big part of you know, being a writer, is to eavesdrop. And not only to eavesdrop on people's conversations, but also on people's hearts and emotions. And that's the harder part, I think. <clears throat> and, and I think that comes with reading. And how, how do you eavesdrop on people's hearts? People don't tell you how, how they feel when they do tell you. They, usually they lie to you, and that's where you need to learn how to detect their lies. So a, a, a couple of years ago, I was in this waiting room, and there's this woman on the phone. Her cousin just died, and she was talking to another cousin, and I think the other cousin called her and said, well, you know, this cousin died, and she was not invited to the funeral. The funeral was already done. And you could see her face, you know, this was in a public space. She was told that her cousin died and she was not invited to the funeral. And her face was just pale. And then, then she smiled and she said, let me tell you, I've, had, I've never had a day of misery in my life. 
she said on the phone to, to the other cousin. And I just thought, that's the saddest sentence I've ever heard someone say, said on the phone because clearly she was excluded from this, you know, family. And she said, I've never had a day of misery in my life. And, and I thought, oh, I, I can see through you. I, can, I know your emotion, but you're lying to yourself. You don't tell yourself this is not right. So, so that's, you know, I think that's what I do. In, I, I came to, into writing really late, I think. I was thinking this morning, you know, when I was 18, I never thought I would become a writer. I was going to be a scientist. And I spent most of my, you know, 20s being a scientist. I only started to write when I turned 30. But what I learned from early on was to eavesdrop on people and to follow people around and to hear their stories. So. It doesn't matter what you're doing to do, as long as you know how to eavesdrop on people. I think, you know, that's probably the best message I could give you today. <laughs>